What we wanted to talk about tonight was this concept of brand equity and um, the extent to which, you know, a, if a CMO is coming into a new role or even just within the organization, um, whoever is overseeing advertising, marketing budgets, um, they're viewed in many cases as change agents or they feel an imperative to sort of affect change within their organizations. Yet at the same time, as is with, you know, the case with many of you, they might be overseeing that advertising and branding and marketing for uh, a brand with a rich history and a lot of equity behind it. So I think what we want to start, um, start with is sort of um, answering this question of how do you kind of strike that balance between preserving brand equity, kind of isolating it, determining what you need to save, what you need to sort of work to develop and preserve versus, you know, affecting change within your organization. So. I'd invite anyone to jump in. I'll start. Sure. Because we just went through this exercise. Yeah. Um, you know, how do you get stronger than the rock? <coughs> and and uh, it really, for us, became about repositioning the rock and building from the rock up. So I think when, when it comes to prudential, the strength and, and the history and everything that comes along with, with the rock is something we wanted to preserve. How has sort of preserving brand equity or sort of, um, you know, strengthening it Changed? How has it changed the challenge of For us, it's made it more challenging. I mean, at Siemens Enterprise, we're about to go through a major rebranding. And the reason I say it makes it more challenging is because what that brand stands for is very different in different markets, sure. right? So if you take Germany, for example, absolutely nobody wants to move away from the Siemens brand. But if you come to the United States, people go, ah, okay, we can do something new, we can do something fantastic. So taking that global perspective, creates an inherent conflict that in the past you could almost differentiate the brand. You could say, okay, well, we're going to do something a little different in Germany, we'll do something a little different in Brazil or whatever. Whereas now, that's almost impossible. Because of digital media. Because, I, I don't say it's impossible, right? It's not that there are differences that don't exist. Yes, there are lots of differences in cultures, regions, all that kind of stuff, but the digital element makes it almost impossible to control how much gets contained versus how much doesn't. I think the digital has definitely forced us to understand that we don't really own the brand, mm -hmm. right? The customer owns the brand, the marketplace yeah. owns the brand, and they are defining uh, what's important to them and how they understand it, and, and, and we're keepers of the brand, ambassadors of the brand, and managing that, but there does have to be an organic element, as you say. You have to, in a sense, let it go, but be extremely aware of what's going down, and when you control it, you control it in a, a non-heavy-handed fashion. We've seen so many... I mean, we can go ad nauseum with, with the situations where you've seen a bad PR move that started with a tiny little tweet and, and blows up in your face. And, and I think we're all aware of the possibilities of that happening with our brands now. I don't think digital changes who you are as a brand. It just means there's more conversations going on, which actually puts a pressure on you to further define who you are as a brand, what your core values are, what you offer, um, what you stand for. I mean, that should be something that is stable. It's like being an individual. You don't change. Um, you can evolve. But people are friends with you because of who you are and what you stand for. So it just means more people are open to you and, and more people are exposed to you and more people will interact with you. So it's not just you talking to them, it's them talking to you, but you still remain um, who you are. So I don't think you should let go of that. I think there's a different part of digital too. I mean, what is digital anymore, right? I mean, that's social, right. but print is digital, think iPad. Think TV is digital, think Hulu, right? So I think digital has also opened up amazing new ways for brands to tell their story. I mean, think video. Uh, you know, you have the opportunity in, to use interactive, engaging mechanisms to tell your story, of an opportunity that we didn't have before. We had print, static, one-pager, things that couldn't talk back, that didn't have the emotion to it. So I think it's, it's leveraging the, the power of the medium to tell compelling stories, and then to your point, to really push those equities further along. And I think to that end, if it's positioned correctly, you can actually have your consumers tell your story for you. So I think the most dangerous weapon in the hands of a CMO is a marker board marker. <laughs> <laughs> and only, only to be uh, only second to the eraser that goes with it. You've now taken on 90% of my job. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think what it relates to what we're talking about is that for so long we. We, whether it's technology or models, we, we've thought of the way we engage customers and businesses in, in models and 
matrices and charts and PowerPoint slides, but to Chris's point, at the end of the day, these brands, as someone mentioned, reside in human beings. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that what digital is doing is it's restoring a, a, an imperative of humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that totally. is, is honesty, well. and honesty and authenticity yeah. and yeah. humanity. That it, if you don't if you don't have a why that really matters, it's kind of like game over. So where do metrics come into play with determining, you know, is there a place for metrics in terms of quantifying, identifying brand equity and sort of where it can change and where it shouldn't? Sure, I mean, um, you know, but it's always snapshots, right? So what, right. what, what I don't look, I mean, I'm only speaking personally, but a snapshot doesn't mean anything to me. What means something to me is a progression over time. So if you say I've got 10% unaided awareness, I don't know if I'm supposed to jump up and down and go fantastic or, or you know whatever, right? Not that that's the metric I would necessarily use, but it's sort of a basic one like that. So it's it's the progression, and if, if I can keep pushing it in in the right direction, that's when I know I'm making progress. And what it does come back to is the other challenge of of CMOs in general. It's not much of the topic today, but I would say is the operational element of a CMO, of not the brand, but the results of the business. I think that. Um you know, change is a tricky word. Yeah. Okay. And this idea of change, overwhelming change, disruptive change, uh, and the emotion around changing something that's familiar to me and or I have an affinity towards. And so I find that when I'm socializing change, especially within the organization, I don't sell it as change. Yeah. yeah. I sell it as refinement mm. or another Very good. point on another the journey. Very making it current, forward-looking. Great brands have done that right. well over right. long periods right. of time. Right. Yeah. And then you'll find, and, then, and there are tons of instances where you'll make a huge disruptive change that all research indicates is a good idea, and the mass is rejected. Mm -hmm. You can't always rely on equity of brand and say, that's this is what we are, this is where we're going to be. You have to look at the service you're providing, let the brand develop that service, listen to your audience, and, and go from there. I also think the testament of the brand's equity, if you can't stretch it, I mean, that's the whole point, right? right. Mm -hmm. The stronger it is, the right. you can stretch it. Sure. So you right. have to test the limit, you have to push it, you always yeah. have to innovate, and you have to be relevant at all times and to all different people. Right. Your customers get older, you have new customers, you have younger customers, I mean, it's, they're all different things you have to take into account. Mm -hmm. So you're always refining, it really right. is refining. You're not right. changing the pillars of the brand cool. at all. Just you know, just evolving. Mm -hmm. yeah. But also maintaining currency. You, know, you yeah. don't right. want to feel old. You want to be fresh. And that doesn't mean you have to transform your brand. Change sometimes implies something's wrong. It may not be wrong. It's just mm -hmm. tastes, interests have shifted. So right. you, you want totally. to be more relevant. So what totally. do you do to make the brand position them in a way that you are relevant at that point in time, and also that you're looking ahead, so you can anticipate trends and be on top of that. Right. right. I remember uh, seeing a a film that was shown to me by an advertising uh, director at General Electric. And this film started off with a silent movie showing somebody leading some, some people through some appliances and showing them how they worked. And then it kind of raced ahead into uh, like the 1950s and Mr. and Mrs. Ronald Reagan were walking through a home showing just how their, their home, how many wonderful things, how great their life was mm -hmm. because of the way that General Electric imprinted their home. And then it raced ahead to something that they had done in China just oh, the week before. And that over a period from like 1917 to then, there was a drumbeat of a brand value mm -hmm. that had thumped through all those years mm -hmm but had at the same time changed and morphed and adapted itself and, be, and had been re relevant in each generation. Uh, I think that's a good example mm -hmm. that I would cite. Mm -hmm. I think Apple's a great example. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. When I first experienced the Apple brand, it was as a student. And it was the brand for students, right? It was right. your desktop yeah. for you the had student a Mac, popular. Right. You were either a Mac or an Apple person or you were a PC person. And if you were a student, you're more likely to be that. But I think that the underpinning of that student's status was innovation and learning and, uh, and, and, and development. And I think now they are 
one of their one of their brand elements or and or positioning elements is innovation. You yeah. take a look at somebody like Apple, right? Here's a good yeah. one. I, I don't look at that as a product company. I think the way they reinvented themselves actually was not the iPod. It was actually iTunes, mm -hmm. right? It was the lifestyle. They started to put music into your running by yeah. putting it into yeah. your shoe mm -hmm. and all that. And I think uh, what you're buying is an attitude. You're buying a mission. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think... Um, uh, we talked about it before, but for example, uh, there are other brands that have been kind of in the dark and disappeared and didn't know what to do. For example, Adidas is another one who came from nowhere and just brought back right. what they were. Mm -hmm. um, other brands like Levi's, for example, you know, was kind of lost in space and suddenly went back to basics and said, no, we are about the workers to bring back cities and bring back America. It's the right moment to do it, but the why, again, is what nurtured their iconicness. Right. So I think the iconic value of those brands is what made them big. I have a similar amount of respect to a company like Old Spice with P&G, who's completely banished their tradition entirely with the Old Spice guy, but he knows uh, and the social efforts and the, and the viral uh, the champions that they've become uh, with that campaign. And you know, initially they actually saw sales drop, and it's, it's, it makes a lot of sense because they really were alienating their core. And then they took a big, big risk begs a, another interesting question, which is at what point or how can you tell what part of your history you need to leave behind? I don't think you ever totally abandon it. I really don't think you, you completely abandon it. I think even in Old Spice's case, I mean, the, the bottle still looks the same, mm -hmm. I think. I, I'm not buying it, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's, the bottle still looks the same. Yeah. You don't completely yeah. abandon it. I think you disproportionately allocate your efforts mm -hmm. on a, from uh, forward-looking. Yeah. You just really right. focus forward, and you keep it there, and it's foundational, and it's helpful, and it's part of a, a lever that you pull at the right time when longevity and commitment to the marketplace and those things really matter, but you just proportionately focus forward. CEOs, at least the ones I'm working with, are, are getting much more interested again in, mm -hmm. in what's going on, right? They're, my boss said to me, he said, look, I don't know whether you're going to like it or not, but... I'm going to be involved in the creative, in the messaging and all that kind of stuff because this is simply too important to the future of the company. Price competitiveness has become um, important or putting pressure on um, companies. Where does equity kind of play in that or, you know, in light of that reality? That's when it's most important. I mean, look at, you talked about Apple earlier. Apple's not cheap. Mm -hmm. You know, you look at all the brands that are successful, it's because they've positioned themselves in having conversations in a marketplace that are not based on functionality or product attributes or all the you know rational stuff it's about the emotional it's about the experience it's about um, the promise and the cool factor to it so in an area in a time when you know people are competing on price it's not sustainable you're not going to win because there's always going to be someone else that's going to be cheaper but how you compete is about your brand has resonates better, you know, has more of an emotional connection, it's more meaningful, and that's how you're gonna stay competitive. Mm -hmm. Totally agree, beyond functional and emotional benefits, it's now at self-expressive, right? So you're using the brand to express who you are, and to take that away from someone is a lot harder mm -hmm. than anything else. So like when you say, I'm an Apple person or IBM person, you're not really talking about the product, you're talking about who you are right, yeah. as a person. Yeah, sure. You're a graphic yeah. guy, you're like that, you know, a numbers person, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's really what you're saying. Nike versus, you know, Adidas, same thing. So you're not going to, you can still keep your price point where it's at. You're creating value, right? You're not communicating the product benefits anymore. You're actually establishing value to get that premium in price or to get the difference. Two sneakers, put them together, right? What's the difference between a Yukon Denali and, a, and an Escalade? They're exactly the same car, but one costs $25,000 more than the other. Buy the same company. Why? Because there's more branding done by Cadillac right. as a premium brand, right? Sure. To sort of create that. You could say the same thing, you know, in, in technology markets of why the installed base is so important because you can charge a premium because people don't get fired for buying your stuff. So you just naturally go in that direction. That's power. I mean, that's right. economic power. That's not, oh, that's cool. That's nice. That's real hard, cold, where when you're saying pricing is getting difficult, how do you combat it? That's how you combat it.